In this section, we're going to talk about the electrical voltage. We will start describing what work and potential energies are. We will talk about forces between charges. We will introduce electric fields. And finally, we'll be able to define the voltage. Let's try to define work. When I say work, I don't mean mm, like a job, but I mean the definition that a physicist will give you. So work is defined on the, on the left. Is done on an object when a force acts on it in the direction of its motion. So this definition is probably not super intuitive. So I come out with a little drawing here on the side to explain it a little bit better. Let's say there's a person here and this person is want to push an object with a certain mass and he wants to push the object in this direction. Now, what the person will do will, will push. So we'll apply a certain force F. This force will be in the direction of the motion, obviously. And after a while, the person hopefully will be successful and move the object from that initial position to another position at a certain distance L. Now, in this very simplified example, the work that a person has done, which I'm indicating with W, is equal to the product of the force multiplied by the distance. So the unit of measurement in this case is Newton, which is the unit of measurement always used for forces, and meters, uh, which is obviously for the distance. This unit of measurement is also equivalent to Joule. Now that we understand what work is, we can talk about potential energy U, which is the capability of a force of doing a work which depends on position or configuration. This is really the key. I have a little example here to understand it better. Let's say you have a ball of a mass M. It could be really any object with a mass that at a certain time zero and it is at a certain height h. Now we know that every object with a mass is subject to the force of gravity, a force that will take the object, push it down and bring it to the ground. So after some time, at a time t, the object would have gone from the height h to the ground. So height equal to zero, for example. According to the definition of potential energy, at a time zero, the object has a potential energy equal to f multiplied by h. Because in that moment, just because of the position of the object, so here how we connect to the definition, just because of the fact that the object is elevated from the ground, the force of gravity F can act on it and do a certain work. Remember that you have work when the object moves in a certain direction and there is a force applied to it in the same direction, which is the case in this example. At time t, the object is on the floor. There is no net force applied to the object anymore and the object and also the height is zero now. So the potential energy is zero in that case. Work and energy, as you can see, are interchangeable in a way. So they're both measured in Joule. One thing that is really important to highlight for potential energy is that the potential energy of an object is not an absolute value. So, for example, in this case, we say that the, when the object is, uh, the ball is at a certain height h, the potential energy is exactly f multiplied by h. In reality, it is possible to demonstrate that every potential energy is defined plus minus a certain arbitrary constant. As long as we apply the same constant to all the other potential energy in the system, everything works. But what does it mean? This seems, sounds a little strange. Now, the energy could be any value. What I'm trying to say is simply that the only things that really matters, the only thing that really has a significant is the difference of energy. For example, between time zero and time t, the difference of potential energy between the two, between the ball is always going to be equal to F multiplied by H. Doesn't matter what is the constant that we add, because when you do the difference, the constant will be simplified. So saying that the ball has energy equal to zero on the ground, it's perfectly fine, but it's just an arbitrary convention. This is something really important to understand because potential energy is intimately related to voltage and the same concept, exactly the same concept, also apply to the voltage. When you say that in a certain point there are three volts, in reality, all you're saying is that in that point there are three volts more than some other point. It doesn't really mean that that point is exactly, absolutely 3 volts. It's simply the difference relative to another point of the circuit. We are almost ready to explain what voltage is. 
But before that, few are a simple concept. So the first is shown here to the right of the slide. Don't, don't read the text for now. This is very simple. This drawing is simply showing something that you probably already know, which is that charges of the same sign repel each other. So whether they are both positive or also both negative, there will be a force that pushes them away. And by the way, this force is called, is called Coulomb force. Whereas if the charges, they have different sign, they will attract each other. This is all nice and easy, but there's probably a question in your mind. It certainly was in mine. How does this charge know that there is another charge Q with the same sign of the charge so that a certain force F is going to be applied to it, depending on the distance D between the two charges? This is an important concept because as human beings, we use that if you want to communicate something, you have to emit some sort of signal. Audio if you talk, video if you wave your hand. But here, that, that's not the case here because charges don't have ears or they don't have eyes. So how do they communicate? Well, uh, to explain this phenomenon, physicists introduced the concept of electric field. Every charge emits electric field in all direction around them. You can think of the electric field as a sort of a sound wave. Just as a sound wave, the intensity of the field is higher close to the charge and becomes lower and lower as you go away from the charge. The electric field will spread at an infinite distance, but obviously at some point it will be really, really, really tiny. And the other charge Q, depending on the relative distance between the two charge, will feel a certain electric field. And depending on the intensity of the electric field in the position of the charge Q, it will be subject to a certain force F. So electric fields are used by charges to feel the presence of each other and reacting accordingly to Coulomb's law. Let's try now to understand what is the connection between electric field and potential energy that we'll now call electrical potential energy because we're talking about charges. The image, uh, the picture here is a similar example as before. We have two charges, Q1 and Q2. For Q1, I show the electric field, which is emitted radially by, by the charge. The electric field is indicated with E. There is a little arrow here just to indicate that in any point of the space, it's not enough to tell the value of the electric field, but you also have to indicate what is the direction of the electric field. And then we have Q2 here, which will fill the electric field. The intensity of the electric field that Q2 will fill depends on the distance r. The higher is the distance r, the lower is the, the intensity of the electric field. Q2 will be subject to a certain force F, which depends on the value of the electric field where Q2 sit, multiplied by Q2. The force F applied to Q2 will push Q2 away and will do a work on Q2 because, again, there is a movement and a force in the same direction of the movement. So because there is the possibility of a work to be done that arises from the relative position of Q2 and Q1, we can say that Q2 has a certain potential energy. To summarize, a charge in an electric field has electric potential energy because work can be accomplished by the field via Coulomb forces. Similarly to the example before, where the ball had a lower energy when it was on the ground, in this case, Q2 will have lower energy if it's very, very, very far away from Q1, because the intensity of the electric field is very small. Some work can be done, but it's a very small work. Whereas if the two charges are very close to each other, they have a lot of potential energy because the work that can be done is greater. It is possible to demonstrate that the potential energy of the charge Q2 can be written with this equation. So U is equal to K, which is a constant, multiplied by Q1, Q2. So it depends on the value of Q1, obviously, because the higher is Q1, the bigger is the electric field. It depends on Q2, because the bigger is Q2, the bigger will be the force, so the, the bigger will be the work that will be done. And it also depends on R, on the distance, because the smaller is the distance, for the same value of the charges, the higher will be the electric field in the position of Q2. We can finally talk about voltage. Voltage is electric potential energy per unit of charge. So in the example before, if this was equation of the equation of the potential energy for Q2, the voltage at Q2, at the position of Q2, will be equal to K, which was a constant, Q1, divided by R. So you see it's simply the same equation, we just eliminated Q2. The voltage is a more convenient way to talk about electric potential energy in electrical circuits, but it's intimately related to the electric potential energy. Voltage, as you certainly know, is measuring volts. 
and the symbol of volts is a capital V. In this section, we'll learn what is electric voltage. We started talking about the physical definition of work. We then move on to potential energy. We talk about Coulomb force between charges. And finally, we talk about electrical potential energy and voltage. These are all fundamental and very important concepts. And while these are not used in the day-to-day -day work of an electrical engineer or of an hobbyist, I wanted to walk you through this path with the hope that I could give you an intuitive understanding of what voltage is. Let's have a little recap of what we have learned so far. So in the previous section, we learned that current is made by moving charges. In the case of electrical circuit, we have electrons that move. So we have some amount of negative charge that somehow is on the move and that generates electric current. In this section, we also learned that charges are subject to an attractive or repulsive force, which is based on their polarity. What this means is that if you take two positive charges and you put them close to each other, they will want to run away. Same if you take two negative charges. Conversely, if you take a positive charge and a negative charge, they will want to attract each other. Voltage is an indication of how strong is the force applied to a charge, which indicates how much the charge wants to move. Let me give you a little intuitive example about this. On the right, I represented a wire in two different conditions. So the wire is the black box. You can think of it as a box where you can put a certain amount of charge into it. In this case, I assume that we have three positive charges in the wire. And we have two different scenarios. So scenario one and scenario two. So in scenario one, the charges are uniformly distributed. So what does this mean in terms of voltage if you want? Well, charges are not allowed to escape the wire, so they have to stay inside. And these charges have the same sign, they're all positive. So they also don't like to stay close to each other. So if you let them be wherever they want to be, they will distribute uniformly across the wire because they have no other reason to distribute in any other way. So that is a scenario where the energy of the charge is the minimum possible because they're already in their preferred condition, in their preferred state, far away from each other and try to use up all the space available in the conductor. So in this case, voltage is equal to zero Charges are moving, there's no current. In the second case, somehow you were able to accumulate a lot of positive charges close to each other on one side of the wire. What do you think is going to happen the moment you let the charge free to go? Well, the charge will immediately spring toward the right because they don't like to stay close to each other and they see a lot of empty space on the right of the conductor. That will cause a net movement of charge in one direction so it will generate a net current from left to right. So you can say that in this case, you have a voltage different than zero, higher than zero with that direction, because the charges are not allowed to be in their preferred state, which is the state of minimum energy, but they are forced to be in a position they don't like. The current that will develop in scenario number two will only exist for a short amount of time. At first, the current will be rather high because these charges really don't enjoy staying close to each other, so they will spring to the right. But eventually, the current will go down to zero. And at the end, after a long amount of time, the scenario number two will look just like scenario number one, where charges are in the minimum energy state, uniformly distributed across the wire. In order to have a constant current across the wire, you need to have a device able to apply a constant voltage difference between the two terminals of the wire. And this device is the battery. Now that both current and voltage have been discussed, we can introduce the concept of signal and noise. Current and voltage are not fixed quantities. They can and usually change with the time inside the circuit. Here you can see the definition of electrical signal. An electrical signal is an electrical quantity, such as current, voltage, or electromagnetic wave, that can be varied in such a way as to convey information. On the right, you can see two examples of electrical signals. This image is a capture from an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is an instrument that can be used to see how the voltage varies across time. In this image, the voltage at two nodes of a circuit have been captured. 
this will be one node and this will be the other node. Now we don't know exactly what's happening here, but as you can see, the voltage is going up and down in a way that sounds somewhat predictable and it definitely looks like a behavior that is intended for a circuit. So this is what we call electrical signal. Conversely, noise is an electric disturbance in a circuit that interferes with or prevents with the reception of a signal or of an information. You can think of it as the buzz on a telephone or snow on a television screen, like, like shown here. This graph here shows how the voltage looks like when it's carrying just noise and no signal. As you can see, the voltage here is just going up and down in a random fashion and not carrying any information. It is important to make sure that the signal is always much bigger than the noise. Let's now look at some notable type of signals. This will allow me to introduce some terminology that I will use in future lessons. I will discuss voltage signals for simplicity, but similar consideration apply to the current as well. The first type of signal is the constant signal. This is a signal that has always the same value at any time. This voltage is also called DC voltage. So this is called constant, but also DC. The second type of signal is the pulse. A pulse is a signal that starts at a certain level, it goes briefly to another level, and then it goes back to the original level. The pulse can go up, can go down, and the two levels are arbitrary. So this signal is called pulse. Other notable signals are the step and the spike signal. This is a step. And this is a spike. A step is just part of a pulse just the edge that goes up or that goes down, that is the step. And you can think of the spike as a very, very short pulse. Finally, this signal is called ramp because the voltage increases or decreases at a steady pace. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about periodic signals. A periodic signal is a signal that repeats its value in regular intervals or period. Here the definition. Let's look at an example. On the right, we have a sinusoidal signal. The cycle is the part of the signal that keeps repeating itself. If we look at this signal, we can see how we can use this part of the signal as the cycle. This part. In reality, there are infinite choices that you can make for the cycle. For example, one could decide to use this as the cycle. It doesn't matter. As you can see, a periodic signal is composed by the infinite repetition of the same cycle over and over. Here I'm indicating that the signal will continue here and will continue also in this direction. This is how a periodic signal looks like. The duration of one cycle is called period, and it's measured in seconds. So in this case, we decided that this is our cycle. So this will be one period. Periods are indicated with a capital T, and measured in seconds. One interesting parameter for periodic signals is the frequency. The frequency of a periodic signal indicates how many cycles are completed by the signal in one second. Mathematically, it is the opposite of the period, and it is measured in hertz. So the frequency is indicated with f is equal to the inverse of the period t, and it is measured in hertz. The amplitude of a sinusoidal signal can be indicated in different ways. The easiest way to represent the amplitude is simply to measure the distance between the center of the waveform and the peak. In this case, this will be the amplitude, and we can call the amplitude A. Another way to indicate the amplitude of a sinusoid 
is to use the peak to peak amplitude, which in this case will be the distance between the two peaks. And it's obviously equal to 2a because the waveform is perfectly symmetric. Other famous electronic signals are the square wave, that looks like this. This is also a square wave, where the values are only positive for the voltage. This type of waveform is very popular in digital systems, and it is used to transmit information or just to generate the clock of a CPU, for example. So this one is really popular, and this is the square wave. Other type of notable signals are the triangular signal, which looks like this. So you see the cycle is a triangle that keeps repeating. So this is triangular. And then another type of periodic signal is the sawtooth waveform, which looks like this. Signals can be divided in two big categories, analog and digital signals. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the difference between the two. Let's start with the analog signals. We have a definition here. Analog signals are signals in which any value of the voltage or the current is used to transmit information at any given time. Even if the voltage on a circuit is limited between two values, for example, zero volts, and the value of the battery voltage, there are still infinite possible values of the voltage in between. And each one of them, at any single given time, is transmitting an information. Let me give you an example. Here I try to represent an audio signal. Audio signal moves smoothly between different values, and we know that each of the points of the curve, at any given time, is giving us an important information. It's communicating what is the value of the pressure change in the air due to a singer or an instrument. So we don't want to lose any of these points because each one of them is important. Even points that are very close to each other, like this one and this one, they're still carrying a different information that we want to keep so that our analog signal is as rich as possible. In digital signals, on the contrary, the value of the voltage or the current is used to represent only a finite number of possible values, usually only two. Let me give you an example. This looks like a classic digital signal. The voltage moves rapidly between two possible values, up and down, up and down. The two possible values of the voltage are either called high and low, for high voltage and low voltage, or most of the time they're just called 1 and 0. So in this case we have a 0 at the beginning, then it becomes a 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0. Now before we move on, I want to make a very important point. Digital signal tend to look like this, the voltage jumps up and down, but that doesn't mean that the voltage is actually really jumping between the low value and the high value. If you take this edge, for example, and you zoom it, you will see that the voltage is initially low, so it's a zero logic level. Then it will start rising, it will probably ring a little bit, and then it will settle to the new value, which is the high value, corresponding to a logic one. Voltages cannot change instantaneously between one value to another. They can't do it physically. So we can say that all signals are continuous and analog in their nature, and really the only difference between analog and digital signal is the different interpretation that we give to the value of the voltage or the current. With analog signals, any value of the voltage or the current at any given time is important in carrying information, while with digital signals we simplify things and we just say that voltages that are high enough are a logic one, and voltages that are low enough are a logic zero. So for instance, if we look at the zoom waveform that we have here, there is a difference between this point and this point. This point is slightly higher than this other point, 
But because they're both high enough, there's no difference of information there. They're both logic ones. How do we determine what is a logic one and what is a logic zero? Well, the designer of the circuit will have to define two thresholds. One will be somewhere here, and is usually called VIH. And the other one will be here, and it's usually called VIL. Every voltage higher than VIH is a logic one. Every voltage lower than VIL will be a logic zero. Voltages in between are carrying an undetermined logic state. So it's undesired value for the voltage. And that is one of the reasons why digital signal tend to move as quickly as possible between logic zero and logic one. There's no reason for the signal to be in between the thresholds. It's not carrying any information.